With all the new Monster Hunter Wilds gameplay that occurred this week at Gamescom, I thought I'd make a video covering just about everything that we know or have seen so far. There have been a ton of hours of Wilds played, so I did my best to patch up as many new things as I could possibly find across various forms of media. Some of these will be repeats from my last video, but there are a ton of new things that I've picked up from streams, some information from some of my content creator friends who have played Wilds at Gamescom, and some things said out loud by the developers in all three of their live streams. So all of these are 100% confirmed to be in the game in its current state. Now I've watched countless hours of gameplay to create this list, so with that said, let's go ahead and get straight into it. In no particular order, here are 127 gameplay features that are coming in Monster Hunter Wilds. Armor is no longer gender locked. There will still be male and female armors, but regardless of your character's body type, you'll be able to use either. Layered armor will be in the game and can be unlocked via progression. Weapons will have built-in skills, for example I noticed ballistics on the light bow gun and speed sharpening on the great sword shown in the first hunt of the first livestream. Weapons will not have bloat values like in World, but will show you the true raw like in Rise and other games. Decorations are returning and we can see where decoration slots would be in the armor and weapons. Armor set bonuses are coming back as well. By having a certain number of armor pieces from the same set, different bonuses can be activated. If you're new to the game or just not sure which weapons you want to use, you can actually talk to the handler, Alma, and she'll ask you some questions about how you like to play, and then she'll give you a weapon recommendation. You can indeed bring two of the same weapon type. Ryozo himself was talking about how excited he is to double up on Hammer when the game releases. Also, the double weapon mechanic where you have one weapon on you and one weapon on your secret is not available right at the beginning of the game, but is unlocked early on. The item bar in the bottom corner of the screen just shows your current item, but can also be expanded to show your full item pouch as well as your secrets pouch. There's also a mantle cooldown timer displayed on the screen, so you know exactly how long until your mantle is ready. Supply items will now be delivered directly into your secrets pouch, so no more grabbing them from a box once you load into the quest. They also seem to randomly restock, I noticed the restocks being mentioned by Alma multiple times in a single quest. Quests can be started from anywhere at any time, all you have to do is go to the map and select a monster to hunt. The map is fully three-dimensional, they said they learned from feedback on Monster Hunter World's map, where the multiple layers were confusing, leading to many hunters being lost, especially in the Coral Highlands and Ancient Forest. To bring up the map you have two options, you can either tap the touchpad to bring up just a map overlay, which you can look at while maintaining control of your hunter in secret or you can hold the touchpad to bring up a fully interactive map. Also in the map, you can see an environment overview. This includes how long till each period, the time of day, and when monsters and other outbreaks will appear or how long till they disappear. You can also move the timer along the timeline to see how long till a certain period or how long an outbreak will last in in-game minutes. You can change your quest target at any time, now this wasn't directly showcased because the demo build had certain locks on it to keep the playtesters in the right spots, but was verbally confirmed by a developer. Now the quest timer begins after you strike the monster for the first time, however this is not always the case, you can fight monsters and deal damage to them without starting this quest as well, I'll talk more about this in a little bit. If the monster hasn't noticed you yet, you can sneak up on it and press an input, circle on PlayStation, to have a sneak attack to deal large damage to start the fight. The quest timer is no longer attached to the health bar, but it's on the right side of the screen, and you can see exactly how much time is left in the quest by holding the button to open your item bar. Damage dealt to monsters does carry over, so let's say you're hunting Doshaguma and you take some time to beat up a Balahara, then you go back and slay the Doshaguma, you can start a quest for that same Balahara, as long as he's still in the map and hasn't gone away, and it will actually still retain the damage that you dealt to it when you start the quest. The auto-focusing feature is still in the game, where you can just tap a button and the camera will center on the monster. Focus mode can be set to either toggle the left trigger or press and hold the left trigger, depending on your user preference. Monsters have a star or difficulty rating system, very similar to Monster Hunter Now's system. It's hard to say exactly how this will play out in the full game, but this could definitely help keep those quote, lower level monsters useful to hunt throughout the entire game cycle. 
The handler, Alma, will join you in the field and she will give you very useful information as is needed. And your Palico will also make comments about how the monster is acting or how the weather is acting. In the top right of your screen, you can see what each input will do, and while attacking with your weapon, it will even show you exactly what move you just clicked. You can flinch your teammates, of course, as was expected. Monster behaviors are more unpredictable than ever, with even some of the development team noting how surprised they were at certain things a monster did during their hunts. There's been at least four new slinger ammo showcased. We had large dung pods, which can scatter an entire herd rather than just a single monster. We have luring pods, which can cause the monster struck by it to follow the hunter aggressively. These can also be used to get a single monster to leave their pack. We saw insulator pods, which can move electricity from the ground in an area where you shoot them. And we also saw something called slinger paint ammo, although I couldn't quite tell what this was for. Many people are suggesting it might be like paintballs from the older games. There's actually another type of pod that I forgot about, which are bleeding pods. These can be used to help create wounded parts on a monster much quicker. You can also use the hook slinger to snag onto a monster to get their attention if you don't have any pods to grab them with. Wedge beetles are back. Each swipe of your whetstone will restore some sharpness, so if you get knocked out of sharpening after only one or two swipes, you'll still get back some sharpness on your weapon. The Palico Tank ability returns, and also Palico Shock Traps. They also did allude to potentially flash bug cages being back, but those weren't shown. The development team mentioned that Palicos are much smarter now, where if they notice you haven't gotten in a hit on the monster in a little while during combat, they can perform actions like a taunt to help draw aggro away from you so you can more easily land an attack. You can bring two Palicos on a hunt. This was briefly mentioned by one of the developers. Mounting can cause wounds to monsters. You can also do a light attack, strong attack, or weapon attack depending on the input that you press. You can use a weapon finisher to end the mount or you can continue moving along the monster to wound it more. Do note that on a couple of occasions it did seem that a single mounted finisher wasn't always enough to bring the monster down. Nearby small monsters can also attack the monsters that you knock down after a mount finisher. The small monsters can also sometimes attack large monsters in the world too, not just after a mount finisher. The insect glaive pole dancing move is actually its mount finisher. Power clashes can only be done by weapons with a guarding ability, and require some level of button mashing to knock the monster back. Turf wars are of course returning, we've seen two with Doshagama so far. However, even if the two monsters don't have a direct turf war, they will still fight each other using their regular moveset and attacks. Different monsters can appear only during certain periods on each map. Monsters will no longer drop materials that you have to go back and gather. They're now just added directly to your inventory. I noticed this especially after a hunter landed a successful focus strike on a wounded part or after parts were broken. Great thunderbugs work like shock traps and can only be found in periods of fallow or inclemency, not during the periods of plenty. These, however, did not work on Raid Dao but Ray Dao can be paralyzed with a paratoad. Inside Ray Dao's nest, the ground is charged with static electricity, which can cause his lightning attacks to have a larger area of effect, but these can actually be, again, put out by some of those pods that we talked about earlier. Great Vigor Wasps are back as well, but these can only be found during the periods of plenty on the map. The different seasons don't actually last that long, with the Santide inclemency of the Windward Plains only lasting about 10 minutes, in most hunts, they'd go through two or so period changes. The Great Vigor Wasps do have a smaller counterpart called Vigor Mantle Bugs, and these can be grabbed with your Hook Slinger and then used like a potion to heal the hunter much quicker. The amount of tutorials that you see on the screen can be toggled on or off or toned down a bit. You can pause the game in single player, and cutscenes can be skipped. Strong monster attacks will show a red flash to warn the hunter that this attack will deal a hefty amount of damage and send them flying. I personally dislike this feature, but I get why they did it. The health bar will also pulse with very large red waves. Doshaguma has a unique enrage mechanic wherein his muscles will flex, reopening all his old wounds that you created before he enraged. Balahara will climb on loose rocks, which you can hit with your hook slinger to knock Balahara down. Balahara can also be knocked out of its burrowing in the sand with screamer pods. Secrets can come in various colors. We're still unsure of the level of customization we'll have but we did notice that there are many secret types. Secrets also have a certain number of auto dodges, 
where if you're riding them and attacked, they will evade the attack for you, but again, this can only be done a certain number of times. Secrets do have an auto tracking feature where they will automatically go to the monster so that way you can do stuff while you're on the back like sharpen or heal or check the map. But you can swap between automatically tracking the monster and you manually controlling your secret using the directional pad on the controller. There are some areas on the map that can only be reached while you're riding your secret and conversely some areas that can only be reached on foot. You can use your secret to quickly escape from quicksand Speaking of quicksand, Balahara can create quicksand, and this can actually drag down the Doshaguma and deal damage to them as well. You can also be pulled down into the caverns below though, so be careful. Now you do move slower in deeper water, but you can actually move at your normal speed on your secret. Skull icons show when the monster is weak or capturable, once again, just like in older games. Barrel bombs can be set down, but you can also pick them up and move them, or roll them into the monster to cause them to explode. Certain monsters can also roar and cause the bombs to explode, even if they're still in your hand. One thing I did notice was that the barrel bombs didn't seem to deal the double damage we're used to on wake-up hits. I couldn't quite tell with the weapon wake-ups because the damage numbers were so low anyway, but it did seem that double damage wake-up hits are no longer a feature in Monster Hunter Wilds. If you place down a trap and it doesn't get used, you can actually just pick it back up and it'll be put back into your inventory instead of being destroyed. The end of quest timer can be skipped to immediately end the hunt. In multiplayer, this will require all players to confirm the skip, and when the quest ends, you'll stay in the field. Accolades akin to those in World are back, for example, who got the most mounts, the most KOs, the most heals used, etc. Monster carcasses now have hitboxes, so no more warping through the monster while you're carving. Quest completion monster rewards can change based on the time of day, the season that you're in, and more. The quest reward screen doesn't stop the game, it actually is just an overlay to show you what you got while you still maintain control of your hunter. Environmental destruction is a thing, for example lightning strikes can burn away grass and leave scorch marks. During the inclemency period while lightning is striking, you will see little patches of lightning on the ground to show where lightning is going to strike. These can hit both the monster and the hunter, dealing considerable damage. Ray Dao's lightning attacks can cause Fulgurite to burst from the sand. This can hit you, and it has a hitbox that lingers afterwards you can climb on it. They did state in the second day that this could be used for something advantageous by the hunter, but they didn't want to spill the beans just yet. Background music can change if you're fighting a single monster versus a whole pack of monsters. This was confirmed by the devs during a Doshiguma fight. Also, there's different music for if you're chasing a monster versus when you're fighting it. This was confirmed by a developer while he was hunting Chatacabra. Thunder Blight can now be removed by rolling a few times, just like Fire Blight. The SOS Flare can now be used online or offline to call in AI support hunters. If you're playing online, you can also use it to call in real multiplayer hunters. You can choose to turn off the NPC support hunter option. So if you want to hunt with just real people, you'll have that option, and conversely, if you don't want to hunt with real people and you only want to hunt with NPC support hunters, you'll have that option as well. The AI support hunters are much smarter. They'll stop attacking if the monster goes to sleep, allowing you to do your own wake up setup. If they notice traps are put down, they will move towards them to help you lure the monster into the trap. They'll attack the main quest target even if you go off after another monster. I even noticed that they'll carve the monster after it's slain. I'm not sure if that means anything, but it's a cool little immersion detail nonetheless. You can customize the support hunter feature by speaking with Alma. Like for example, you could bring one support hunter so that way you could bring two of your palicos as well as some other combo options. Bow guns now have varying types of infinite ammos. We've seen infinite normal two, pierce one, and spread one with elementals and other heavier ammos still needing to be crafted and having a limit. This could change from bowgun to bowgun, but the infinite ammos are moderated by a gauge. The infinite ammos and their level are fixed on each bowgun that you create. This is very similar to how different guns have different ammo types in previous games, which is another feature that will also continue in Monster Hunter Wilds. Different bowgun ammos can have different reticles. The normal reticle hasn't changed much, but check out the new spread reticle. There's a new feature called optimal healing, which some people are calling automatic healing, but I think that kind of gives you the wrong idea. 
The optimal healing option can be selected, and based on how much health your hunter is missing, it will then automatically choose the healing item for you, but you'll still use the healing item. It'll choose one that will fill up your health bar most appropriately. So if you're missing like a tiny amount of health, it'll probably choose a regular potion for you to use, and if you're nearly on empty, it would instead choose a max potion. It simplifies having to heal, hopefully cutting down on scrolling through your inventory looking for the right sized potion. Fishing no longer uses bait types, but various types of lures. Cooking in the field allows you to make full meals, even in the heat of combat, and the animation can change based on the ingredients you selected. Be wary that cooking in the field, especially during combat, can be interrupted. However, one of the developers actually managed to pull it off mid Doshaguma fight with no problems. There are three ingredients you'll choose for cooking. You'll have your main ingredient, like meat for attack boost, fish for defense boost, and veg for elemental resistance, followed by an additional ingredient and a seasoning to add your food skills. The capture net is back, as well as various rare versions of endemic life, so hopefully we can get to populate our hunter's house with creatures again. You can actually see here that the baby Puke Puke has a little nest with eggs. The developers confirmed that these guys only appear during the bountiful period of this locale. Now while combat and weapon mechanics look similar to World, many play very differently overall, with new moves appearing and many old moves either not being in the game or being changed or altered pretty substantially. Now underwater combat is not returning to wilds as confirmed by one of the developers. There are however certain spots on the map that you can traverse while swimming underwater. Many weapons have a mechanic like a perfect guard or perfect dodge that reward the hunter for having good timing. For example, both dual blades and bow have something like an adept dodge, where if you dodge at the right moment, you get more damage or a boost to your stamina. The dual blades demon dance has multiple attack inputs now and will consume your gauge. The weaker blade dance that was previously only available in arch demon mode is now also available in demon mode, and you can swap between the full damage blade dance as well as the weaker damage blade dance mid combo. Bow coatings are no longer a consumable and will refresh with its new gauge as you attack the monster. The tracer arrow that is new in wilds is also tied to your gauge level, and perfectly doing the dodge will fill the gauge faster. Perfectly dodging with the bow will also give you back most, if not all, of your stamina bar. The bow jumping aerial attack is actually its sneak attack, so you won't be able to spam it like you did in Rise. Lance has a perfect guard mechanic, and you can do a charge counter poke after your normal 3 poke combo to reset into another 3 poke combo. Switch Axe has access to a new parry attack, which can be used in both Axe and Sword mode. However, Switch Axe's zero sum discharge seems to be locked to being only a mount finisher now. Power Axe is coming back to Switch Axe, with the wild swings into heavy slam to power up the Axe combo remaining the same as it was in Monster Hunter World. Hammer has a new dash move that helps maintain the charge level, and once it's fully charged, you can do that spinning windup attack shown in the overview to unleash a more powerful ground pound attack. Hunting Horn's Echo Bubble will deal damage if you play another song while it's still up, and each Echo Bubble also has its own effects that can apply to the hunters that go inside it. One that I saw was Evasion and Movement Speed Up, for example. One thing we did learn is that Hunting Horn buffs will persist even if you swap to a different weapon. This is likely so if you're hunting in a party, all members won't lose their buffs if you decide to change weapons. However, this may make Hunting Horn a mandatory secondary weapon for those of you who, like me, like to go for maximum DPS. Charge Blade has a new mode where you can partially use up a file instead of expending an entire file on a single attack. You can no longer do your super amped element discharge from a standstill in axe mode, it's now a follow-up attack to other axe mode attacks. Insect Glaive can now charge up the Kinsect, allowing it to gather multiple extracts at once. There is currently no cooldown on this move, so you can just repeatedly and rapidly gather your extracts. Insect Glaive also has a new and powerful move that will use up all three extracts. However, if you land the attack, your Kinsect will regather all three extracts, allowing you to use it again. However, if you miss this attack, you'll just use up your extracts and be left with none. Insect Glaive's strong jumping advancing slash or the little helicopter attack will no longer keep you up in the air if the attack connects, so say goodbye to infinitely aerial Insect Glaive. Rest in peace. 
Light Bow Gun's crouching attack can be used after any rapid fire shot to give the next rapid fire shot a bonus bullet. For example, if it's two shots in rapid fire, it'll go up to three on that crouching shot, or if it's three, it'll go up to four, etc. Heavy Bow Gun's ideal range is longer than it was in previous games, and Light Bow Gun's is even closer, trying to further distinguish the uses for each of the Bow Gun types. Heavy Bow Gun's shield does have an auto guarding feature, so as long as you're not shooting, the shield will block attacks, but the power clash for Heavy Bow Gun can only happen if you manually perfectly time a guard. Heavy Bow Gun now has a quick sidestep move that can be used for repositioning, however it does consume some of the rapid fire gauge in order to balance it out. Heavy Bow Gun's roll still looks like a fat roll, but the animation is noticeably quicker. Heavy Bow Gun Wyvern ammo is back, and once it explodes you can actually burn away grass in a small area, which just looks super awesome. You can now roll cancel out of the Longsword Helmbreaker. When you land on the ground, you can just smash roll button to roll out of it. The attack won't hit, but you also won't lose your spirit gauge level. Longsword's new focus strike can level up the spirit gauge as many as two levels, so you could go from white gauge all the way up to red gauge. The new move after the Helmbreaker is called the Spirit Release Slash, and it seems to happen automatically after a Helmbreaker lands, as long as you don't roll cancel the Helmbreaker. Weapons do seem to have more than one Focus Strike type, which is very good. Pop-up camps have specific sites that they can be placed at, with each site having a varying degree of risk. High risk areas mean that monsters are more likely to be nearby, and they can come and destroy your camp. Finding a good balance will be crucial, since the pop-up camps are where you can change your equipment, restock items, and where you'll be dropped off to respawn if you cart. Speaking of carting, check out the new carting animation. This is too funny. I really like this one. You can also be knocked out of the pop-up tent if you're inside it when a monster destroys it. If a pop-up camp does get destroyed, you can repair it or rebuild it again later. And pop-up camps cost a certain amount of research points to set up. I saw an amount of 100 for a safe camp and 200 for a dangerous camp. These were shown in the live streams. You only get a select number of campsites that you can place on a given map, with three being the limit here on the Windward Plains. Damage numbers can now be shown as whole numbers, numbers with decimals, or they can be turned off completely. We also have an extensive look in at some of the weapon controls that are available here at the Gamescom demo. I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested in seeing your weapon of choice. Wow, alright guys, that was a lot. There are of course many more things that you may have noticed, and if something you know of wasn't covered here in my list, be sure to drop it in the comments down below. If you did enjoy this video or if you found it helpful, then be sure to drop a like. It supports my channel totally for free and helps YouTube know to recommend this video to other hunters. If you're new to my channel, new to Monster Hunter, or you just want more Monster Hunter Wilds videos, then go ahead and hit that subscribe button. This channel is going to be the best place to find guides, sets, tutorials, hidden facts, and much, much more for Monster Hunter Wilds, and subscribing is the best way to never miss an upload. With all that being said, I want to thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I wish you all a good day and happy hunting.